So to start, I just wanted to thank you all for joining today. My name is Giancarlo Valdetero. I'm a senior policy and outreach associate on the transportation here, at transportation team here at Smart Growth America. Uh, we are a national nonprofit that empowers communities through technical assistance, uh, advocacy, and thought leadership to create livable places, healthy people, and shared prosperity. Um, in this position, I staff the National Complete Streets Coalition, one of SGA's programs, which furthers the development and implementation of complete streets policies and practices to advance safe and accessible streets for all and create a transportation system that supports communities across the US. Last month, we hosted our first ever Complete Streets Power Hours, speaking with two implementers from MnDOT and one advocate from the organization Our Streets Minneapolis about how they work to establish a clear commitment to and vision for Complete Streets from both inside and outside the halls of power. These three Minnesotans described how that commitment and vision aren't things that get delivered to us from on high. It requires an intentional reckoning with the past, sustained engagement with the present community, and ongoing daily hard work to build a shared vision for the future. Today, we'll take a slightly different approach. In speaking with our guests today, we'll look to share tactics amongst advocates for our local fights for protected infrastructure and against unsafe expansions, and strategize as to how we can collectively change the conditions in which we have these local fights through policy changes at the state, local, and federal level. We will dig into what our fight looks like, discuss what happens when obstacles are in our path, and look to build momentum among the, among the broader Complete Streets movement. If you're an implementer, though, we encourage you to stay for this time. In addition to learning from the insights our guest provides, you are part of this fight. You all have significant power in your roles, no matter where on the bureaucratic hierarchy you are. Yesterday, during a meeting on mitigating the impacts of highway expansion, a community member told one of my colleagues, it's like I'm being told that my hands is getting cut off, but I'm being asked how I want that to happen. As transportation professionals, I know none of you got into this profession in order to stand in the way of progress or make a community member feel like a project is causing her harm. Unfortunately, due to the broader transportation policy system, funding streams, and standards that you work within, that can easily end up happening and often does. In order for progress to occur, advocates need allies and accomplices like you within the transportation bureaucracy because this current setup is a disservice to all of us, whether you're an advocate, an implementer, or just a community member who wants to get home safely at the end of the day. Before I ask our guest to introduce herself, I wanted to go through three quick policy updates um, that are relevant to all of you in the audience. At the local and state level, uh, yesterday, California's Department of Motor Vehicles revoked the license of automated vehicle company Cruise after Cruise withheld video footage from an ongoing crash investigation. This comes less than two months after the California Public Utilities Commission expanded Cruise's ability to operate robo-taxis in San Francisco, despite the objection of advocates like ourselves at Smart Growth America. If you live in a jurisdiction where Cruise or a company like it operates, we encourage you to contact your elected officials to let them know about this information from California. Staying in California, Jeannie Ward Waller, Cal Transformer Deputy Director of Planning and Modal Programs, was removed from her post uh, in September for objecting to two highway projects that she claimed were greenwashing themselves by using maintenance funding for what was actually a road widening project. Unfortunately, we believe that the actions that she was trying to stop are relatively common in our field, and we encourage um, both advocates and allied implementers to make sure that actions like these are not occurring as they shouldn't be. And last but not least, earlier this month was Week Without Driving, which is a perfect segue into our guest today, Ana Zivartz. So Ana, if you'd love it, or I'd love it if you could introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. And yes, Week Without Driving just wrapped up. I actually spent a good chunk of the day yesterday going through TV and other news clips uh, from the week because I didn't have a chance to read them all or watch them all. And it, it really made me excited all over again. Uh, so it's great to be here. I want to tell you a little bit about who I am and how I got into this role. And um, yeah, I'll start with, so I, I'm here in Washington state right now. This is a state I grew up in. I was born here, raised here. 
And then I lived in New York City for uh, close to 15 years with a little uh, foray to Arizona before coming back to Washington State about five years ago. And I was born with an eye condition called nystagmus. So if you look closely, you can see my eyes are moving just a little bit like this all the time. Um, and what that means is that my visual acuity, depth perception, um, ability to track objects uh, moving quickly is, is limited. And so I am gonna be kind of close into the computer here. You'll probably get a good uh, view of all my pores and wrinkles um, so I can see the screen and, and check out the chat occasionally. What this also means in the transportation space is that I have never been able to drive, um, at least not safely. I did try to drive in high school. I had a friend offer to teach me in her mom's truck and uh, I drove it up a tree in a parking lot and thankfully we were not hurt. The truck did not, <laughs> was not so lucky. Uh, the tree survived there, the tree is still there. It was a big old cedar tree. Um, but yeah, I had to spend the summer uh, clearing blackberries to pay back her mom because we were uh, definitely not supposed to be driving. I was definitely not supposed to be driving that truck. Uh, and so, you know, as my peers got, were in high school and got their licenses and could go and go places they wanted to go, I felt really trapped and isolated. I grew up uh, outside of Olympia, Washington, which is a pretty small town, but in, on a rural road, uh, no sidewalks, bus service was two miles away. Um, not really a walkable, walkable safe distance, especially at night. And so as soon as I could, I, I promised myself I would get out of there and I would go and I would live somewhere where I had the ability to have friends and have a social life and not have to ask my mom to come pick me up. Actually, when I met my husband, uh, <laughs> I had to have my, I asked my parents to drop me off at like three blocks away from the address, right? Where the bar he was supposed to meet me at. Cause I didn't want, I was so embarrassed about not being able to drive. And I, I didn't know anyone else who couldn't drive either. And so, yeah, um, that led to me moving to New York City. I spent many years working, doing video advocacy for social justice organizations, for the ACLU's LGBT project, uh, Innocence Project, many labor unions fight for 15, the Occupy work and that happened in New York and, uh, and eventually started a video production company there. Um, that still exists. And, um, but when my son was born, he was born with the same eye condition I was. I decided I really wanted to connect more to the disability community. I needed that support. And so I started following folks online on Twitter. Uh, Alice Wong was a huge, um, uh, someone to follow for me and, and learn from. And uh, then a friend posted a job back in Washington State uh, for Disability Rights Washington. And I decided to come back and it was, a really interesting experience. It was hard in many ways because I knew I would be returning to a place where my inability to drive mattered a lot more. Uh, and especially as a parent and all the parent things you're supposed to do that involve driving in most parts of this country. But it was also really awesome because I got to meet other people who couldn't drive other adults. And I see Courtney Cole on the, car, on the line now. She's posting links in the chat and she was one of the people that I met at Disability Rights Washington and, and got to know and got to see that there were so many of us out there uh, that couldn't drive or couldn't afford to drive. And I had I'd seen the affordability piece earlier, working in, in labor, working with immigrant workers, uh, working with folks who had lost their licenses. The ACLU was really interested in folks with suspended licenses and, and um, courts that were actually holding people in jail when they couldn't pay fines and fees. And so you know, I knew this was an issue, um, but it, I hadn't seen it in the in the context of disability before, aside from my own experience. And so that's sort of where the, the roots for um, the work that I do now started. Uh, as the pandemic got going, I convinced uh, the folks at Disability Rights Washington to let me uh, start an organizing project focused on bringing together non-drivers. And this is a long way to get to where, where the work started, but I think it's important. Um, and this work Really, I wanted to make visible because I know growing up in Washington State, I hadn't known anyone else, uh, any other adults who didn't drive. And I, I knew there were a lot of us out there. And as I started trying to get the numbers, I was pulling driver's license records and it looked like a good quarter of the population didn't have a driver's license in our state. And, and people, that number was shocking. It was really shocking to people. And so we went out to start to, to try to document the stories of people who couldn't drive, couldn't afford to drive 
Uh, we're too young to drive. Um, we're aging out of driving. And we brought those together in our story map project. And um, this is still available on the website. I think we have around 275 stories documented. We made sure to really make an effort. The goal when we started it was could we in the by the by in two months when the legislative session kicked off, could we have stories from every single uh, legislative district in the state? And we got there. I think it was it took us three months, but we got there. And that was so important because people always assume that people who can't drive are in cities, in places that are walkable, in places that have really good transit. And the reality is we're everywhere and we're often the places that are most affordable. And so those places aren't necessarily in urban cores. And so Anytime a legislator came to us and was like, hey, I don't think we, gotta, we don't need sidewalks and in, in, uh, I'll pick on Yakima. We don't need sidewalks in Yakima because no, everybody drives here. We could pull out the story map. We could bring them into a meeting with constituents and say, hey, actually, um, this person here <laughs> lives in your community just a few blocks from you, actually. And they can't drive and they would like sidewalks. And so. Um, I'll, I'll turn it back to, uh, <laughs> to you because uh, I think that gets us to the, the complete streets um, connection here and how that how that connects to the work we do. Yeah, no, 100 percent. And I really appreciated all of that backstory. I think one of the more difficult things to explain to people who don't think about transportation all the time is just how big the community of non-drivers truly is for all of the reasons that people don't drive, whether that's because they are too young or too old to drive. You know, I was once a kid and didn't have a driver's license until I was 16 or 17. And that meant that I had to rely on some kind of adult, somebody with a driver's license to get me wherever I needed to go because the place that I grew up had basically no infrastructure for getting yourself to the places you need to go, like school, um, and other activities. Um, had a, a friend in high school who had a, a grandfather who was in his early 90s, I want to say, and who still, you know, managed to drive himself around. But the minute that he decided it wasn't safe enough to do that anymore, his mobility, his quality of life, um, all of a sudden decreased greatly. Um, and I mean, you know, if people have a temporary disability from something as simple as an ankle injury, even if people simply don't want to drive, you know, there are a lot of people who going on various roads is really frustrating. Um, I think that you've really done a good job outlining why, um, why that focus on not driving at all is really important. Um, and as part of that, um, I think you were connecting um, some issues that we might call small potatoes. Um, and you do this more broadly in your work when you're talking about things like a sidewalk obstruction, whether that's like a bike that somebody's left on the sidewalk, a utility pole that's been put in the middle of a sidewalk, um, or you know, a transportation sector job, um, like a transportation planner requiring a driver's license. You talk a lot about those um, issues that some people might think of as smaller fixes. And you're able to connect them really well to, you know, a lot of these more broad issues, um, like the proportion of people in the U.S. who don't drive or broader legislation to repair sidewalks, like you were talking about with the legislator in Yakima. So do you think you could explain why it is so important to have the really fine grained details and the higher level um asks and actions um, when you're talking about envisioning complete streets in a world with more complete streets? Sure. I mean, I think there's, I guess I come to this from an organizing background, um, started my my career uh, working as a, a union organizer. And so, you know, you have to talk to people and understand what are the issues that they experience in their lives. And in this, in the, in the organizing work we do with disability mobility and the work I did before that, it really was, you know, this sidewalk in front of my house, I cannot, I have to run out in the street, roll out in the street because there's this crack or this intersection, I cannot cross. The cars go way too fast and there's no signal or there's no accessible signal or, you know, there's this on-ramp that I have to get across to get um, to the nearest bus stop. Like it's those, those things that people experience in their own lives uh, that bring people in. 
and and they're also fixable, right? A lot of these things are are small potatoes, right? Uh, but then as you start to see the connections between this and the system that we built in our country that prioritizes car dependency and the mobility of people moving in cars and moving in cars at high speeds, right? Above everything else, um, that's when you can start to think, okay, how does this change um, move us away from that car dependency? And so making sure that the things that we're going to put a lot of energy and fighting to uh, or fighting for are doing that, right? And so we're not just embedding ourselves deeper into um, systems of car dependency. And I, and I think of this in the context of a lot of, um, you know, micro mobility um, or, or uh, micro transit, perhaps, and not so much micro mobility, but um, when, you know, sure, having a ride from point A to the transit stop or from point A to point B, um, and, and maybe that's a, a subsidized ride, that's great. Um, hopefully it's wheelchair accessible. Hopefully, you know, it works for people with a range of disabilities and language access needs. Um, but that isn't necessarily transforming our communities to make them more walkable and rollable, to make the distances shorter. And, um, you know, the cruise headline, right? Um, if, if we're thinking about it, communities where you do have to rely on getting rides everywhere, what does that mean as far as affordability? Um, does it result in more sprawl, um, further distances, and more restrictions or more difficulty for those of us who need to walk or roll or bike somewhere or, um, or yeah, simply can't afford to use that other system um, to pay for a ride? So uh, that's, that's sort of the big frame um, is how do we how do we move us away from the system of car dependency by improving the little things um, that people, you know, that will make a difference and will make it easier um, and, and listening to the things that people who are already using the systems, walking and rolling and relying on transit, that what, what we need the most, what we prioritize. Because I think it's kind of like asking someone, um, you know, who doesn't use the system, oh, what, what would make you use the system? Well, that's very theoretical. Um, and maybe it does change their behavior and maybe it doesn't. But if you ask someone who's already there day in, day out, waiting at that bus stop, like, would you like this pothole filled so you're not getting splashed? It's, it's very rainy in Seattle right now. So this is my experience <laughs> last night and this morning and waiting at a bus stop where every time a car goes by, you get, you know, a face full of the, the grit water. Um, you know, th those things do make a difference right away. And they may not be what some someone who isn't sitting there at that bus stop would prioritize. But um, I think it's important, really critical to be listening to the people who are um, having the most direct experience and the most direct harm um, in the systems we built that don't serve us. Right, and I think you get at a really important thing there, which I'd like to dig into a little bit, which is that there are a lot of different avenues that we can pursue. Um, for improving our transportation system, um, both in the short term and the long term. Um, some of these avenues, um, you know, you and I would probably call them band-aids. Um, depending on the context, I think that's what you could call a lot of microtransit, right? It's like compensating for a lack of um, operating funds or ability to operate frequent fixed route service um, or for, um, last mile connectivity to fix route service. Um, and I think one of the challenges in the complete streets movement um, is that a lot of our um, friends on the implementer side only have some of those Band-Aid options available to them, right? And so one question I kind of have for you is, um, and I mean, this is part of the, the broader theme of Power Hours, um, it's like if you're talking to somebody who's on the implementation side, maybe they're um, part of a city um, department of public works, they are um, at, a, at an MPO, um, how would you encourage them to think about um, these specifics or to orient their actions so that they are both improving conditions for people um, who are having a difficult time getting around right now without entrenching the car dependency that makes it so difficult for them to get around? <laughs> that is that is a tricky question. Um, and I think, you know, there's there's tension, right? Um, what, what I'm thinking about right now, a lot have been involved with the TCRP panel on, on transit-oriented complete streets and like the tension between, okay, 
we want buses to move quickly. We want our trains to move quickly. We have them on these major corridors. And then we expect pedestrians, right, to be on these corridors and be crossing um, to these streets. And there's a couple of places here in Washington state where we've seen a lot of crashes or where we're building major, major investments in light rail along highway corridors um, and then expecting people to cross on and off ramps. And uh, I saw Dong Ho Chang here from WashDOT, so he knows exactly one place that we're working on here in Washington to get fixed. But, you know, there are um, these tensions. And I, and I do think, you know, it's not, I, I, unfortunately, because of the way so much of our transit is set up, um, you know, maybe they're thinking about a station access area, but that's a very small circle around a station. And how do people outside of that little circle get there? Um, you know, but, and then with sidewalks, because they're too often the responsibility of private property owners, we're just not thinking about them at all. And that connectivity that you can expect as a driver just doesn't exist as a pedestrian, definitely doesn't exist as someone on a bike. Um, and so, yeah. That, that connectivity of pace, I think, is, is so critical and, and comfort, right? Um, sure, you may have a sidewalk, but if you're right next to a bunch of uh, high-speed traffic with no kind of buffer, um, if there's no lighting, um, if there's blackberries dangling and hitting you in the face, that's another fun thing we get here a lot, <laughs> especially uh, this time of year, end of the summer, the blackberries are, are wild. So um, what, you know, and it's dark or there's puddles or um, you know, so many things that can make it really, it's loud because you're next to really loud traffic, um, you know, the air quality, all those things um, that, that we need to consider too. And, and having just the physical infrastructure of that sidewalk um, with curb ramps, if you're on a big high screen road, is still a, a stressful experience um, for people. Better than not having the sidewalk, but how could we actually make that an experience that people would seek out, um, whether it's, you know, a more human scale environment, less parking lots facing the street, uh, more retail, lighting from retail, um, just more people around so that it doesn't feel so desolate and, uh, you know, lonely. Um, all of those things also are are part of it. And, and land use, right, is a huge part of that. So again, we, you know, we everyone, if you're at an agency, the piece that you can bite off is really small. And that's, that's frustrating. I um, would love us to move to, to a place where our transportation departments really are land use departments. And so we're thinking about how people access, um, access get, get, get access to where they need to go versus how can we move things quickly the, the longest distance. And unfortunately, all the metrics right now in most of our transportation uh, departments are set up to just, yeah, that level of service, like how do we move things quickly um, versus are people able to access what they need? And is everyone. Um, and really that, I'll just uh, heart back on the non-driver piece, but it really is 30% of our population as nationally, more in some places. And I can paste a couple links in the, in the chat. Uh, the state of Washington funded a study conducted by Tool that came out last year, found 30% of the population is non-drivers here in Washington state. Wisconsin did a similar analysis, found 31% of their population. And it, um, there's a really interesting, you know, some of the highest populations of non-drivers are in uh, rural low-income areas. And so it isn't just cities, right? Um, we need to be thinking about this access everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, no, completely. And I think I have two thoughts on that. The first of which is that it feels like transportation both doesn't consider enough of the other things sometimes like transportation planning and transportation policy for often for um, legislative reasons doesn't consider enough things like land use um, and yet at the same time transportation is asked to solve the problems of uh, things like bad land use you know like we're asked to have these super high streets because people or super high speed streets because people hypothetically need to travel really far because that's what the land use dictates. And so it feel, can feel sometimes like it's this um, catch 22 um, where we're damned if we do and damned if we don't um, in the, the transportation policy realm. Um, and the second thing I was gonna say is you mentioned, um, you know, the, the statistics of how many people or what percentage of our population is non-drivers. Um, and you also talked about uh, something that seems to be a little more of a trend in the, the transportation planning world, which is like listening to people who already use services about how they could be better, as opposed to asking the person 
getting out of their car, you know, like, hey, you drove here. What would it take for you to walk here or bike here or metro here? And for them to say, well, you know, if they did A through Z, I would do that. But in reality, they're still going to drive. You know, they're always going to move the goalpost. Um, so I think one question I have um, is what would processes, um, which hypothetically, you know, planning staff can have some um, some control over to a certain extent in terms of the choices that they make, what processes in particular make you say, oh, yeah, this um, outreach, this engagement, this broader planning um, is centering the perspective of people who can't drive and the the knowledge that they do have and trying to to use that as much as possible for the benefit of all of us who aren't served well by this system. That's a good question. And I think uh, Seattle's known for processing things to death. And so the word process just sends like ooh, all over because I, I think, you know, there's also, um, you know, you can do rounds and rounds and rounds of community engagement and hear from the same folks with the most privilege, which is usually who you hear with in any kind of community engagement process, right? It's the people who have that time to show up, um, to not have another job, to have the transportation to get there, to have the childcare, to have the language access, all of those things, right? And so uh, I am leery about community process just for the process's sake. Um, and I think there are but, um, you know, at the same time, we don't have people with that that lived experience inside of agencies or as our elected leaders. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And I think that needs to change. And so, you know, first call is uh, you mentioned the driver's licenses, but let's make sure that we have more recruitment of people into agency staff positions who are uh, who have that direct experience, who live in a community, who have a background um, from that community, who have a disability, who are low income. Um, there's a lot of educational requirements, too, and I, I know that there is value in, in some of the education, but I think there's also a lot of credentialism that happens, and uh, I, I do really firmly believe that riding the bus for five years um, teaches you a lot about planning um, that, that you may not get in a planning uh, degree, and so um, really figuring out ways to, to value that experience, so that's part of it. I think another piece is uh, for people who are at agencies and who are elected officials to go out and do things like the week without driving, uh, to walk and roll in your communities, to ride transit on a regular basis. Um, there's a mayor uh, quoted in one of the week without driving articles who had never ridden transit um, in, a, in a community in California. I won't name names, but, um, you know, th that that isn't great. And, um, you know, for many of us who can't drive elected office isn't feasible in most of this country because of the, the requirements or the expectations around travel and time and being at events. And, and so we're not going to be in elected office. We're not going to be, therefore, we're not going to be on the transit boards. Um, and so we are in, here in Washington state pushing currently to change the law that regulates who's on transit boards across our state so that we have a, a voting seat for uh, for someone who's a non-driver, someone who relies on transit, because chances are we're not going to be in elected office and on that board otherwise. And many of the folks on those boards don't rely on transit or don't have to. And so um, having that more than just uh, advisory power, um, but uh, actual voting power, decision making power, I think is really key um, when you're setting up community input processes. Um, when you're thinking about how to do equitable engagement. Um, I was part of a, a, an equity committee here with King County Metro, which is the, the transportation uh, agency, the transit agency for the, the larger um, Seattle area. And I think there was a lot done right there as far as really trying to, first of all, make sure that voices who wouldn't normally be at a table um, were there. And then also having agency staff and elected leaders really look to that for guidance. And that helped us come up with our, our planning guidelines for the region. Um, but at the end of the day, that was because the elected leaders and, and agency staff decided to prioritize community input. Um, and, uh, and that doesn't always happen. And so I do think thinking about how do we get better structures where we have uh, have voting power um, for community members is is really key, um, and not just uh, you know 
token advisory committees. Right, right. And I think building off of that, um, your your line about process, um, you know, causing a, a visceral reaction is um, incredibly relatable. And um, there are some bike lane projects in DC right now that are going through process, um, which is really, you know, just looking for somebody to say, I don't want this loudly enough um, for, for them to not have to do it. Um, one of the things though, that I noticed you there talking or you talking about there was making sure that there's representation in certain parts of these existing structures and existing processes. Um, and so I was wondering how you distinguish between the roles in these structures, the parts of these processes that would really be changed by having different people in them um, versus the structures or processes that like are just in their existence antithetical to the goals of having a system and have that supports non-driving people to having complete streets. Like where, how do you draw that line? Um, and how can, you know, other advocates think about these, these distinctions in their communities? That is, that's a good question. I mean, and, and coming from sort of a labor background, I really do think that the power that we build and, and how much non-drivers are prioritized is going to come from us having, um, us organizing externally to any of these structures and, you know, making our voices heard in, 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 in the political system. Right. Um, and, and that's part of what we do, um, as a nonprofit though, you know, you're always walking that fine line of, okay, how do we also work within the system? Um, and not just in sort of an electoral space. And so, um, you know, I, I, um, yeah, that, that, I think that is, that is a tricky question of how much do you engage and at what point, you know, having sat on a lot of, you know, bike ped advisory board commission committees, like, you know, how much of advocacy energy gets sucked into those. Um, and then nothing happens because that takes up all the time, I think is, is important for people to keep looking at. And then also just continually looking at who is in those rooms, who is in those spaces, even if they're compensated spaces, um, you know, who is there and who is not there, um, I think is is so key. Yeah. And when you when you go into those spaces, um, like the the advisory board for King County Metro, um, are you thinking about beyond like the stated impact of that board? Are you thinking about the other ways um, that you can make an impact in that setting in terms of like interacting with the other people who are involved with the staff that are involved, like making recommendations about the broader process and broader like efficacy of those organizations, of those structures, um, so that they can, you know, better support complete streets and these outcomes that support life outside of vehicles. Yeah, I mean, I think in the King County Metro Equity uh, Cabinet case in particular, I think for a lot of us who were brought in, um, it was a leadership capacity building exercise for us. Um, and, and for me personally, it was one of the most valuable things I got out of that space was recognizing that, okay, wow, I do actually know a lot about transit, having used transit my entire life. Things that maybe people who work at a transit agency don't realize. Um, and especially coming from sort of an access focus um, in the disability space. And so that, you know, I think led me to want to fight harder to have uh, voices and representation in these kinds of spaces because I recognize they weren't and there was so much knowledge. And so I think there is, if done right, there can really be a capacity building uh, aspect to these so that you learn the, yes, those relationships that who to reach out to at the transit agency when, when you need to, you know, get something fixed or, um, just how the whole structure works and how the funding works and how it goes through the county council and like understanding the systems can be a powerful tool as well. Um, if, yeah, as long as it doesn't just turn you off from it completely because you feel like it's just so slow moving and slow, um, you know, designed to prevent change, which right. I think some systems are. Oh, yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And kind of you you mentioned having a moment where you were like, oh, I, I actually do know a lot about transit. Um, for for anybody else who like might be in this call, um, and you know at some point is going to be interacting with city staff and officials. Um, not to put you on the spot, but do you remember like what 
particular piece of information or what pieces of information that you had that, you know, um, agency staff may not have had that made you think, oh, right, like, because I've used this system so much, I know a lot about how it works. Um, do you remember what those particular pieces of information were? I remember a very specific piece. I do think, you know, that this was right before the pandemic when when this group was meeting and i think overall one of the main messages that came out with the, with our recommendations for planning was that there really are so many folks who rely on transit especially in in places that aren't um the most dense or the mo that the places that are the most affordable because that's where we can afford to live and when the pandemic happened and transit ridership on all the commuter routes just kind of went poof it was these places that um, that had a lot of transit reliant folks where ridership sustained. It really did. It held. Uh, and so it just showed the importance of investing in those places versus um, some of the other routes that maybe had really high ridership numbers, but those ridership numbers went away because people using them had many options. Right, right. I think that makes a ton of sense. And speaking, speaking about options, um, we've kind of been dancing around the subject the entire time. I'd love to dig it more into week without driving. Um, specifically, you know, some of the uh, epiphanies, you know, you already mentioned one um, in terms of the the mayor who had never ridden transit before, um, like the specific epiphanies that decision makers have had surrounding it, um, kind of what work has gone into, um, getting it the attention that it deserves um, and how to turn the, you know, realizations that elected officials and their staff have into actual policy change. And I can definitely state each of those individually as well so that uh, we're not having to like take notes on. on yeah, I'll, I'll start and then just feel free to jump in and reprompt me. But so just, just a little background on Week Without Driving. We started it in 2021 and it it actually did come out of an experience I had in D.C. Um, with um, then candidate, now Mayor Mario Bowser, um, who uh, I was hired by a labor union to do a, a day in the life of um, with a, one of the, the um, housekeepers from a hotel. And so we met the the, the, the then candidate, um, Mario Bowser, met the, this this housekeeper at her home way out and we rode a bus and then we transferred to the, the metro. And I remember back then you had to pay twice. Um, and this was a big amount of money for this person um, to have to do this and not have a free transfer. And just that conversation, I remember very clearly about like why that was not a great thing and how it needed to change. And it has changed now, which is great. Um, but I thought about that and thought about when we were doing uh, all the story map work, how much it would be awesome to have elected leaders out, you know, partnered with non-drivers in their communities and experiencing um, what it was like to get around. And so that was sort of where it came from. Uh, we didn't have the physical infrastructure uh, to partner one-on-one -on -one, everyone, but we did try really to bring in the first year conversations between elected leaders and then folks from their communities who weren't on drivers. And that's sort of been the, the heart of, of what the week has been is really focusing on the, the folks who don't have that access. It's not a celebration of biking. It's not a celebration of transit. Maybe those are there, you know, things that come out of it, but the really the heart is this access question and how do people in your community, because there are people in your community who don't drive, how do they get their, their needs met? And so uh, started in 2021, this year uh, was our third year, and we partnered with America Walks to uh, be able to bring it national because there was just no way we were going to be able to, to make that happen in Washington State, just us. And so America Walks and um, Mike McGinn, who's there, and an incredible uh, organizer, Ruth Rosas, um, took it on and helped us reach out to organizations across the state to be hosts. And then in, in some places, individuals just heard about it and signed up. And it was cool. We weren't really sure how big it would get this year. Um, we didn't have a ton of resources. We didn't have a snazzy website. Uh, but it was amazing to, to hear the stories on social media um, and newspapers. And I think one trend that I'm pulling out from this year that I'm particularly interested in, and, and we've heard this in previous years too, is how challenging it is. People are like, oh, I could do it until I had to take my kid to X, Y, or Z, right? And the parenting piece of what does it mean uh, when 
when we set up our communities in a way where it's only kids who have parents who can drive that get to do all the extracurricular stuff. And I think that's that's a really interesting question. Um, I know there's a professor at Rutgers, Kelsey Ralph, Ralph uh, who's done some research on the impacts on intergenerational, well, on, on poverty, basically children who grow up with parents who can't drive um, and the impacts on that, on their uh, ability to um, have a job, go, go through college is profound, right? And, um, and it's, you know, just because of the driving piece unrelated to everything else. And so connected, but, you know, a, a factor of the driving. And so I, I think that's something we can talk about um, because I think that really does have generational impacts. And what does it mean to make our communities work better for parents who don't have cars? Could make it easier for parents who do have cars that have to spend all their time driving around, but also could really make sure that every kid has a chance to participate in their communities. And I'm trying to find the tweet now, I'll see if I can find it, but uh, there was someone I think from California who was an elected official who tweeted about taking his kids to gymnastics at the rec center and posted a picture. And it's like a very nice gymnastic setup in this local community rec center. And it led to this longer Twitter thread around, you know, if we invest in our local community centers, how much easier it is for every kid to then have that access versus, you know, when it's all privatized and people are expected to drive across town or to an exurban community to have access to any of these kids' activities. So that's one of my takeaways this year. I think it's connected to the, you know, 15 minute city or land use conversation as well, but also, yeah, how do we make it possible um, for our communities to have the resources we need so that we aren't expected to drive or people who don't drive just don't have access to those resources. Right, right. And when when we think about making it possible, um, in terms of the follow-up, like with elected officials who have had potentially for the first time, the realization that, oh, like this bus only runs every half hour if I miss it or or every hour if I miss it, all of a sudden my day is at the very least delayed, if not completely shot. Um, do you have any thoughts, advice, um, strategies um, for people who are looking to translate those epiphanies into actions, into policy changes? Yeah, I mean, that really is the next step, right, is having, you know, I mean, it's one thing to participate and recognize that, oh, my gosh, there's no butt surface on Sundays or after 6 p.m. on Saturdays. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, but then, you know, how do you how do you get that funding for bus service? How do you convince the transit agency or elected officials to to you know find the funding to do that? And so, yeah, I think that that will be the next step. And something that we're really interested in tracking along with America Walks this year is are there are there changes? Are there things that are getting better? And um, you know, I think there is a lot of funding out there right now, um, thanks to some of our big federal investments. Um, but it takes a lot of work to track that down and, and make it happen. And so motivating people to go then chase that funding and, and start to um, improve things. So, yeah, I, um, I think, you know, we have seen and, and there's a lot of pieces coming together. We also passed a big um, transportation investment bill here in Washington state. And so we're seeing the impacts of that along with the federal investments. But we are seeing a lot more transit service which is really exciting. Um, Sunday service in places that haven't had Sunday service in 20 years. And I think, you know, those those changes are things that we can point to and um, and be really excited about. Right, right. And um, one of those, one of one part of that um, legislative package, um, I believe, is the default complete streets requirement. Right. Yes. Um, and from can you talk a little bit about from your perspective, what the impact of that legislation has been. Definitely. And um, I think I, I can share some links too about the, the complete streets policy, it's complete street mandate uh, for our state highways, which is really exciting and transformational. And I think it kind of snuck under the radar on the package because um, I think we could have had a lot more opposition if people realized what it was doing. Uh, but basically on, on any of our large highway projects now, um, there has to be, there's basically this analysis, um, and if it's deemed to be an area that, that needs a sidewalk either based on our, our and bike infrastructure structure based on our state active transportation plan or on, um, adjacent, uh, on local plans um, for the adjacent community, then that has to be part of the, 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 you know, the, the, re the rebuild. So if it's a repaving project, 
Um, that's part of it. So that's that's great. I know there's people uh, from the state on the call who can get much more into the technical details. Um, but I have to say it um, I wasn't sure, you know, how it was going to be received um, across the state. I, I got hired this summer to come out and um, bring disabled community members on some walk roll audits in different parts of the state. And I was picking on Yakima earlier, but now I'm going to give Yakima a shout out. Um, Yakima is a, a, a pretty um, rural community, um, definitely agricultural in the eastern part of our state. And uh, we went over there for one of these walk roll audits and with some community members from Yakima. And I was expecting, um, we were talking about uh, bike infrastructure and pedestrian infrastructure, and um, we had rented e-bikes to go out um, with a bunch of planners and engineers from our state DOT. And I, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes about, you know, the east part of our state um, and people's, uh, you know, reliance on cars and everyone drives and nobody wants bikes or bike lanes or, or pedestrian stuff. And so I was prepared for that. Uh, but instead, what I saw was was the planners and engineers who worked for the the local um, the local region for for our state DOT really really excited about the complete streets mandate and excited about thinking and and being asked to think about how does everyone use this street not just cars how do we design it in a way where people walking can also get through here safely and um, at one point we biked through the slip lane uh, on a, on a I think it was a city road, but it was a slip lane coming off a highway. And uh, um, yeah, just the reactions of people afterwards being like, oh my gosh, that was really gnarly. Like, how do we make sure that this other project we're working on doesn't have that situation? And it just, it, it felt really hopeful for me. Um, and uh, I think it, it has given people the space and, you know, because previously it was just, okay, all we're going to design for is cars um, to, to design for the for, for other people as well in other modes. And, you know, that's just the first step of making it comfortable and easy for those other modes to, to be there. But, um, you know, especially in our state highways to have that uh, mandate in place, I think um, is, is going to be transformational. Yeah, no, I, and I think Dongo put um, yes. the, <laughs> the in the chat, um, which I'll, I'll add the one detail that um, this for all projects um, done by the state with a budget of five hundred thousand dollars or more, which is many pro like, which is all projects. <laughs> um, stuff is expensive, so yeah. like basically, um, almost anything meets this bar. Um, and I think, you know, at the National Complete Streets Coalition, like we want to make complete streets the default approach. Um, and this is at the very least a significant portion of that puzzle. You know, like it's, um effectively in in many cases mandating complete streets for the state projects um and it was done through a legislative change right and it still faces headwinds at the federal level because uh most of the funding at the federal level for highways um is still for making them wider and faster um and helping them move more cars um and i think this gets because we we have a little less than 10 minutes left and um, this gets at kind of the the broader point of these power hours which is also to talk about like what changes we want to see on a policy basis at all levels um and for those of you who are listening feel free to put these to put what you want to see in the chat as well um but on as we start to wrap up um i'd love to hear kind of your vision um for for what you want as uh, an advocate doing this work, um, as somebody in this space, what do you see um, both the, you know, Complete Streets visioning process um, looking like, and what do our communities, what do our streets look like um, when Complete Streets and safer streets are the default approach? Sure, yeah, and I'm gonna start sort of uh, I guess like policy, small picture, but you know, I think with this complete streets mandate at the state level, the challenge now is going to be, you know, that it, it is every maintenance and preservation project now has become a lot more expensive because it includes this complete streets component, which is good in some ways because I think it's going to force us to think, okay, do we really want to widen this highway? We can't <laughs> because um, we have to be investing in these other pieces as well. Um, and so, you know, I think making sure that we do continue to, um, you know, fund maintenance and preservation so that these these projects can get built as part of it. 
um, at, and then this is just on state highways and it's such an intricate web of, right, like, okay, this is state right away. And then we have county, we have local, um, it, you know, we need a network. <laughs> uh, we don't just need the state roads uh, to have this, this network. And so how do we do this in other communities, um, in, in local jurisdictions and, and in places where perhaps, you know, the political winds are such where um, the narrative is that, oh, everyone drives here and nobody wants sidewalks, right? Which isn't true. Um, but it may be a majority of folks or a majority of voters um, don't prioritize sidewalks or transit. And so how do we continue to make sure that infrastructure exists in those communities as well? Because we can't, those tend to be the communities that are further out, more affordable, and where more non-drivers are uh, moving to or being forced to move to. And so, um, yeah, the, the local piece as well. In, in Seattle, I think we are pushing uh, for a piece of legislation. We have the complete streets legislation here in Seattle. Um, didn't have enough teeth, I think, to get us where we need to be. Um, and so, and it also didn't cover because of our sidewalks being the responsibility of private property owners to maintain for the most part. Um, we are hoping that this new legislation, if it passes, uh, will mandate when the city does a repaving project, they will also repair the sidewalks and build missing sidewalks if there's no sidewalks. And so, um, that sort of just gets around this, okay, private, public control of sidewalks. The city already goes in and repairs a lot of them anyway, when they get really bad, um, in places. And so can we just make this standard that the city is, is doing that sidewalk maintenance? So those are, those are a couple of the, the little pieces, um, bigger picture. <laughs> um, I, you know, I really just hope that week without driving and this conversation around non-drivers can help people see that that we exist and that we are a political force and or we can be if we start to organize. And so that in other communities and other parts of the country, um, there is that, you know, that organizing and that awareness happening. And a tool for that is Week Without Driving. Um, a tool for that is, is partnering with the disability community, partnering with immigrant communities, partnering with youth who increasingly are choosing not to drive because of climate concerns and cost concerns. Um, and seniors aging out of driving. Um, there's a lot of folks who are aging out of driving, who will be aging out of driving and still want to, you know, live vibrant lives in their communities. And so um, there's a lot of us and I think we just need to start organizing uh, for different priorities. Yeah, I completely agree. And that is what we are hoping to do with these calls. So thank you so much for, for coming on today. Um, and the the last question um, I'll ask you before wrapping up um, is something that we've kind of kind of gotten at um, before, which is or throughout the call, which is like, what's the most helpful thing that the implementers that you work with could do um, to make your life as an advocate easier? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, I think first of all, being willing to recognize that you know, who is being served and question who is being served um, with current budget or policy priorities. Um, I think that's part of it. And, you know, I'm going to shout out to um, Christina Walker. She works uh, for the Tucson uh, Department of Transportation currently, but used to be the Nevada DOT head. And uh, she had something kind of similar to Week Without Driving, but she called it the director's challenge. And she asked everyone in on her team to take one trip, not a recreational trip, one trip walking or biking every day and report back to her in her weekly meetings um, with leadership. And I think, you know, if you're in an agency, that's something that you could institute. Um, you can also do week without driving, but, you know, just on a continual basis, asking the people you work with to one trip a week, um, walk, take transit, um, one trip that you wouldn't otherwise walk, take transit or bike somewhere. And, and then think about the infrastructure you you encounter, the the systems you encounter, the land use you encounter, and have a discussion about that on a on a weekly basis. I think it starts to uh, just change the frame of what we're what we're prioritizing. I think that's a great way to end. That is such a such an easy lever for so many people working in an implementer position to pull. Um, and before we go, I wanted to mention a couple of additional events that are occurring over the next month or so. A Worldwide Day of Remembrance for Road Traffic Victims is on November 19th. Um, you can uh, find in the follow-up email um, a 
link to the event website, which is run by a few organizations that we at the National Complete Streets Coalition partner with um, frequently, including Families for Safe Streets and the Vision Zero Network. Um, in addition, we have a date and time for our November Complete Streets Power Hour, uh, which will be taking place on Tuesday, November 28th uh, from 10 to 11 or from 10 to 11 a.m. Central Time. Apologies, my calendar has switched to Salt Lake City time. Um, and finally, um, as you're leaving this session today, um, there will be a short survey to complete uh, both in the chat and um, in a follow-up email that will show up from Zoom, um, asking you for any questions or suggestions you have for the movement more broadly or for our additional power hour taking place late November. Um, in case anything comes to mind after you finish filling it out, we will be resending that survey um, along with uh, resources from uh, Anna later this week um, and on a follow-up blog. Um, so on behalf of Smart Growth America and the National Complete Streets Coalition, thank you so much for attending today, and I hope to see you next month. And thank you, Anna. Thank you. What a great conversation. Thanks for hosting this. Of course, of course, always happy to have you.